we deploy to funds and anything that we do not have deployed to funds, we hold in Bitcoin. Every year, it takes a couple of months of consolidation post the halving before we really start to see that Bitcoin price truly rip and reach new all-time high. For me, the FASB's ruling that Bitcoin on balance sheets can be fair valued and should be fair valued, that was bigger news than the Bitcoin ETF was. Companies starting January 1st, 2025 will be able to fair value Bitcoin. How likely is it that Microsoft actually goes ahead and buys Bitcoin in the next year? It's already 100% guarantee. And I base that almost exclusively on BlackRock owning something like 9 to 10%, which means that at the actual shareholder meeting, the proxy vote, they're probably going to end up being a substantial amount of the vote. Guess what instrument they're probably going to use at Microsoft to buy and hold Bitcoin? Probably going to be that magical BlackRock ETF. The Microsoft CTO said, I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before, but Bitcoin is an incredible, powerful concept. And I don't think we have fully grasped what it could mean for society. If I'm a small public company and I see that Microsoft is clearly planning something around Bitcoin, I look at this and I go, yeah, you know what? It is an inevitability that Microsoft will be buying Bitcoin and they're huge. So maybe they could do something like a sailor playbook. Maybe I should be rethinking my corporate treasury strategy. And if I can front run Microsoft and I can acquire a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand Bitcoin, that might not be a bad idea. Everybody should be holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet and anything that doesn't need to be used for operations should be in Bitcoin. Before we get started with the topic, I think today that's the, is one of the days where context might be interesting. Uh, so like uh, really quick, like what are you doing with Samara? What is the company doing and what is uh, kind of the, the vision there? Yeah. So, I mean, Samara Asset Group is a publicly traded company. Um, it's based out of Malta, uh, but it's listed in Germany. Um, it actually used to go by the brand Cryptology Asset Group. Uh, the company was founded by um, German serial entrepreneur and investor uh, Christian Angemeyer, as well as uh, Mike Novogratz um, of Galaxy Fam. I don't think I need to tell anybody on your channel who Novo is, right? Um, now, the company was initially intended to be this merchant bank for all things crypto. Um, you probably remember back in 2018 when the company was founded, uh, Malta was really pushing this blockchain island thing. Um, at the time, and they were trying to have friendly regulation. Um, they were really trying to push friendly um, banking and compliance uh, for crypto companies, particularly the exchanges. I mean, and basically uh, how that went is the ECB just looked at the island and said, the fuck you are, um, and basically got everything Malta was trying to do killed, right? Um, so they weren't ever able to really establish cryptology as this merchant bank uh, the way that they had initially envisioned. But What happened is uh, cryptology invested in a handful of companies that were building in the Bitcoin and the blockchain space, um, one of which was actually my company at the time. Uh, I didn't found uh, Samara or cryptology. I only joined as CEO in January um, or rather February of 2021, I think. Um, but Samara invested in my company, uh, Deutsche Digital Assets. Uh, we were one of the first ETP issuers uh, on a regulated marketplace anywhere in the world for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other uh, financial instruments. Um, so really proud we were able to be one of the first pioneers there uh, here in Europe. But when I stepped into Samara, um, the balance sheet of the company had absolutely ballooned. I mean, we were invested in companies like Block One, who, regardless of how you feel about the EOS uh, token sale, if you were an equity holder of Block One, um, I mean, at one point they had more Bitcoin than God. So it was a pretty good equity investment, right? Um, you also, We also had Northern Data, uh, one of Europe's largest Bitcoin miners, and now one of the main players um, in the AI data management space. So that investment has performed really well. So the balance sheet grew pretty substantially. And when I stepped in in 21, um, I told our investment committee, look, we can have, there's one of two ways we can do this. Number one, we can leverage our, at that point, damn near half a billion euro balance sheet. And we can continue to deploy to early stage companies in the Bitcoin and the blockchain space. Um, But to do that, I'm going to need an army of analysts. Um, I mean, if you're investing uh, on the venture side of things in crypto, there's a thousand deals to look at every year. Um, it's very difficult to cipher through what the deals are that are truly worthwhile. Um, I mean, as you know, uh, there's a lot of scams. There's a lot of nonsense in crypto. And I mean, even for any 
one company or any 10 companies a venture group invests in, maybe only one or two pan out. So I told them we can take that route and I'm going to have to build out a huge workforce for Samara. Um, or we should start deploying to managers themselves. Um, rather, instead of deploying directly off of our own balance sheets into the companies, which is historically what Samara has been doing, uh, we deploy to managers, we deploy to funds, and anything that we do not have deployed to funds, we hold in Bitcoin as our primary treasury reserve asset. So that's basically been our strategy uh, for the last, let's say, two and a half, three years, ever since I stepped in. Uh, we've been able to liquidate a lot of the legacy investments that Cryptology Asset Group had made over the last couple of years. And through that liquidation, we've been able to stack um, a decent amount of Bitcoin. I still obviously want to own substantially more. Um, even 21, even 20 million Bitcoin on my balance sheet won't be enough for me. Um, but we've also been deploying to a lot of fund managers uh, over that period of time. I think at this moment, we now have 19 different fund investments, which give Samara Asset Group uh, indirect exposure to the performance of over 700 portfolio companies. So we have a very diversified, um, uh, very robust balance sheet. And basically, we're offering our shareholders the opportunity to participate in the performance of that 700 plus companies, and of course, Bitcoin, uh, merely just by being shareholders of the company itself. Interesting. So they you are holding as a treasury reserve asset Bitcoin, but you are investing uh, in a broad spectrum of companies with the with your company. Exactly. So, I mean, we have so we're not necessarily investing in companies. Like I said, um, the company historically had done that when it was Cryptology Asset Group. Now we're largely deploying to funds, and funds, of course, largely deploy to ventures and to companies. But some of them are liquid hedge funds, right? Um, so through that, we have exposure to uh, over 700 portfolio companies. Plus, I mean, I think we have, as of right now, roughly 421 Bitcoin on our balance sheet. Um, okay, so it's either 4 and 21 or 4 plus 21. I don't know, whichever one, 420 and 1, whichever one you want to call it, right? Yeah, 420 four <laughs> would be the perfect number. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. But 421 four four is... One. Uh, for, for, for 20 and one. Yeah, really cool. Um, you also mentioned that the ECB fighted down the, the Malta project of having this blockchain, uh, island. Um, do you still feel that the ECP is, is, is fighting Bitcoin, uh, and the ecosystem? Oh, do you feel like that, that that's still happening in a big sense? Oh, did you see the, I mean, so as of this recording, we're recording this on what Monday, October 28th. Did you see the article from Forbes that just came out today? Uh, so Forbes put out an article, I forget if it was today or maybe it was over the weekend and I only just saw it today coming back from Lugano. Um, they put out an article that the ECB and the Fed intend to be completely weaponized against Bitcoin and they want to do so either through outright bans or ridiculous taxation. Um, and this comes on the heels of uh, Italy increasing its tax on Bitcoin from what, 26 to 42%, I think they announced they're planning on doing. Um, so I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see taxation become a weapon that has ended up used by governments. Uh, like, I mean, these are supposed to be independent agencies, but the ECB and the SEC are, are and every three letter agency is completely captured by the government at this point in time. Um, so they will be weaponized against uh, Bitcoin. And supposedly they're going to try to do this to pay off the trillions upon trillions of dollars of debt that they've racked up over the last couple of years, which is really just kind of funny. Um, it just shows how, frankly, uh, forgive my French, but how absolutely retarded the ECB and the SEC are. They could just buy and hold Bitcoin and be able to pay it off um, any debts that they have in their entirety over the coming years. And I think that's part of the strategy, for instance, that Donald Trump is planning on employing as he wants to have a, a Bitcoin treasury reserve. It was Senator Loomis that first brought this legislation forward. Um, using that, uh, using uh, reserve assets at the US government uh, to purchase Bitcoin as a part of a strategic reserve. The same thing we do with every other commodity, we have a strategic oil reserve, or rather, I should say we did until Joe Biden and his ilk um, completely destroyed it just to make sh pretend that the economy was actually still going and that inflation wasn't bad by keeping the price of oil down. Um, but yeah, uh, 
that probably will one day be used as leverage or used as assets to pay off the massive amount of debt that the U.S. government has taken on um, by irresponsibly printing trillions upon trillions of dollars. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the ECB do something similar. Interesting. Uh, how important do you think it is uh, the question of who will be the next president of the US as the as, as they have some uh, saying in, in the ECB and in the, in, in the Fed also, the, I think that it's qu quite an important role. How important do you think is, is that for, for Bitcoin, who the next president will be? I, I think it's incredibly important. Um, I mean, and you have to remember, so, uh, okay, so you have the two primary candidates, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, right? Uh, Trump historically uh, hated Bitcoin. In 2016, when he was elected and the four years afterwards uh, that he was the president, he did absolutely nothing um, to push for Bitcoin adoption. He called it a Ponzi. I mean, he was really a part of the uh, mechanism that tried to suppress Bitcoin. So we can't entirely forgive and forget. Uh, what Donald Trump did with Bitcoin, right? On the flip side, though, Donald never necessarily weaponized any administration against Bitcoin. Um, he, at least as far as we're aware, we have not seen, or we at least at that point in time didn't necessarily see the SEC as weaponized against Bitcoin and crypto as it was. Of course, there were some uh, Wells notices put out. Of course, we didn't get the Bitcoin ETF during that period of time. But nowhere in the world had a Bitcoin ETF, ETP. Um, that was traded on a regulated marketplace. There were a couple unregulated um, uh, marketplaces that had ETPs in Europe for a couple of years, but nothing that actually had a formal approved prospectus to be listed on a regulated marketplace. Um, so I'm not going to be too critical then because maybe they just didn't want the U.S. to be the first mover to do something like that. Um, but the last four years, the Biden and Harris administration, they have objectively weaponized every three letter agency they possibly could against Bitcoin, against crypto. And I mean, you saw Trump come out earlier this year, late last year, as being a huge advocate for Bitcoin adoption. I think the primary reason this happened is Vivek Ramaswamy uh, got to him, right? Um, I mean, Vivek was uh, part of the primaries for the Republican Party before he decided to step out and endorse Donald Trump. And I think a big part of that was is that Bitcoin um, is something that's a core thesis for Vivek. Um, he is very anti-CBDC. Uh, he sees CBDC as the absolute utmost tyrannical financial instrument for globalist communism. So I think that messaging resonated with Donald Trump and allowed him to finally, I hope, see the light on Bitcoin and also be come out very much against CBDCs. Now, is the, does he actually believe in Bitcoin? Is he really truly against CBDCs? I don't know. I never trust a single thing that politicians necessarily say during election cycles. They'll say whatever they can to get elected. And that, to a certain extent, is what I think he is doing. But with that said, if he follows through, clearly Bitcoin and crypto will be in an infinitely better place than what we've been under for the last four years of the Biden and Harris administration. So but if I were to play devil's advocate, um, you can largely say the same thing of um Kamala Harris, because for instance, over the last, I mean, again, you can't necessarily trust a politician with anything that they've been saying um, during the election cycle, but at least over the last couple of months, Kamala has come out and she has said that she will work with Bitcoin or she will work with Congress to pass Bitcoin re uh, legislation, crypto regulation, and really try to roll that back. However, my whole thing is if you are in charge right now and don't get me wrong. She is the literal vice president of the country at this moment in time and has been for the last three and a half, nearly four years. Why the fuck haven't you done anything then? You could have changed this if you wanted to. So do I think Donald Trump is necessarily a Bitcoiner? There's, it's, I would probably say more so than, uh, more so yes than no. But do I trust Kamala Harris at all? is going to do anything positive for Bitcoin and not just lie like she has been about everything that she's planning on changing relative to all the policies that her and Biden have enacted over the last four years. I don't trust that at all. 
Um, I think she's just saying that to try to capture moderate votes or to get some votes away um, from the Trump momentum train uh, within the Bitcoin and the crypto industry. But we'll we'll see how it shakes out. Um, I mean, I've never voted for Donald Trump at all over the last couple of years. I'm a libertarian. I've always voted libertarian. This time around, though, I will be voting for Donald Trump. Uh, I'm a one issue voter, and this is, I think, one of the most important voting topics of what will happen with Bitcoin and crypto regulation moving forward. So I have to, in the great state of Pennsylvania, cast my vote for Donald Trump. It's it's really interesting uh, to see this this whole election cycle. Uh, the last election cycle, and I not, did not really uh, follow. Yeah. Uh, I was not really interested. In, obviously, I'm Austrian. I'm EU citizen. So like, um, <laughs> well, I, it, it's hard for me to really care what's going on with America. But right now, I'm really like, I'm, I'm, I'm watching more American uh, election things than Austrian election things because, I'm, yeah, it's, it's, it, it has a big impact on, on Bitcoin overall, yep. even though Austria politics uh, directly point to me more. But it's interesting for me, Trump, when I hear him speak and when I hear what he does and what he, he does in Bitcoin. I'm like, okay, he gets it probably like one, two percent. Yeah. Uh, if like the the elite is getting it like eighty percent, uh, saying like Sailor, Cyphedine, Jeff Booth, and all those people get it like maybe eighty percent, because I think nobody is at hundred uh, percent. Trump has maybe some few percent, but I think he really trusts in Vivek, in uh, RFK, and what they are yeah. saying uh, to him, and they get it way more. You can see it in the in the in the speech also was RFK gave in Bitcoin Magazine that that was a really good one. He really hit home some some really good points so i think uh, that's that that that's great that he has people in his administration and in his uh, circle who actually understand bitcoin and that's a really positive thing if it would only be trump i would be more <laughs> more skeptical i would be but too, there are yeah. really good people behind him i mean that's a very fair point you have to look I mean, we always think of the presidential elections as really just electing one guy and then the backup to that one guy in case, God forbid, something should happen to the one guy, right? It's really significantly more than that. It's just that you always have that cult of personality following around the one presidential candidate and to a certain extent, then the backup guy, the vice president, rather than you really are electing an administration. Um, you're not even necessarily, I would say, electing a party anymore. I mean, the U.S. does have – it's a two-party system. I hate it, but it is what it is. We, it's the reality. We just have to suffer for the current period. Um, hopefully, that changes in the near future, but I don't see a realistic way it does um, over the course of our lifetime. Now, with that said – when you do get an administration, you are going to get the likes of Vivek. You are going to get the likes of uh, RFK. You are going to get the likes of Tucker Carlson. Like, I don't even like Tucker, but holy God, how incredible would it be to see him as the press secretary and just absolutely troll the mainstream media uh, for the next four years, right? It, it, it would just be hilarious, right? Like top-notch entertainment television. Um but you really are getting that whole administration. And it's, I guess it's still yet to be determined, at least publicly, what roles each of these individuals will have um, in the administration. But if RFK really does become something um, overseeing the EPA, um, overseeing the um, uh, all the various health organizations, the FDA, for instance, EPA, I'm not sure I would be uh, a big fan of, and even Trump said on Rogan, he doesn't want RFK involved in every, anything environmental, even though I'm pretty sure RFK would love that. But on the FDA side, the Food and Drug Administration, I think RFK would be phenomenal to completely uh, reroute our entire healthcare system, which absolutely has to happen um, in the United States. And maybe Vivek becomes something of a Treasury Secretary, SEC related. Um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. And I think you're right. Having those people behind you certainly enhances uh, the Trump ticket. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think uh, I forgot before, like J.D. Vance and Eric Trump, they are also kind of low-key Bitcoiners. They are often forgotten oh, that yes. they... They, they they're kind of they, they also get it I think uh, way more but don't get <laughs> as many publicity as the, the others. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and to that extent, it was disappointing to see uh, the administration, or rather, I don't, I don't even know who or what introduced the Trump team to what was it World Liberty Finance or whatever the hell the shit coin was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I don't know who introduced them to that. I don't even know what the fuck World Liberty Coin does. I mean, they never even said anything about what this uh, utility token supposedly is, right? I mean, do you know anything? I know actually not. I did not even do them uh, them the mercy do research it because I was like, yeah, okay. Exactly. He's I just, just like on off. the first yeah. step of in understanding Bitcoin. Like oh, <laughs> everyone in the first step of understanding Bitcoin wants to create their own shit coins. Like that, that that's just how it goes. I, I, I think that's the evolution people do go through. They see, okay, Bitcoin. Um, it, when you're, when you're still kind of learning what Bitcoin is, and I think you're right, like Trump understands 2% of Bitcoin, right? Uh, which is really, he just knows it's orange like he is, I suppose. Um, so then you always just go and you try to issue your own shit coin, right? Um, but then I think once you're in that industry and once you really start to do your own research and once you really start to engage with the Bitcoin and the crypto community, you see that it really is just Bitcoin that matters. Um, and not to say that there isn't value in Ethereum. I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist by any stretch of the imagination. I, as a libertarian, if people see value somewhere, kudos to them, um, to each their own. Just for me, it's Bitcoin and Bitcoin alone and everything else doesn't matter. Absolutely. I, I mean, that's, I think that's uh, a good stance. I, I, I don't like the toxic trade of like, oh, oh we should uh, fight against all the other assets. I mean, hey, the free market will take care of it. Like if, if there's no value and I think there is no value, the free market will take care of it. Like there's no reason for me to, to shit on it, even though I was for one year ago, the one that was really maxi and really yeah, yeah. toxic, but I actually grew up with the podcast. I think, uh, I think my, my Bitcoin maxi guests made me less Bitcoin maxi. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, so I would agree with you. Um, the toxicity is horrifying. It's deafening and it doesn't benefit anybody. Right. Uh, I mean, like you have, you have the Max Kaisers of the world that, and I, I don't think that he's actually like this. I've met the guy once, um, really, really nice guy, very different personality behind closed doors than he is publicly. So when he's out there, absolutely lambasting, um, the general public, the general crypto public. Uh, I don't think he necessarily means it. I think he's doing that for clicks and for views, right? Um, which it's attention grabbing. I mean, it, it, he's a wild personality in public on, his, on when he does his podcasts and everything. So I get it. Um, I would just like to see substantially less of that from both sides of the aisle. I think it's perfectly re I mean, at the end of the day, this is largely a cypherpunk libertarian movement I don't understand why we can't live and let live. I mean, we're all kind of in it together regardless, except for the scammers and the I real shit coiners because they can go fuck themselves to death. Um, but like people that are actually building something legitimate or at least are attempting to, I don't understand why we're attacking them. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I I got to know a different Max Kais on my podcast. Actually, he was on there a few months ago, uh, like not even months ago, probably like five weeks ago or something like that. And, and I was surprised because I only saw those those <laughs> those other things from him, and I was like, oh, like that will be an interesting one. But he was so <laughs> calm, he was so relaxed, like he was so leaned back, and I was like, oh, that like, that was an interesting one hour. And I got so many comments like, oh shit, like he was so relaxed. I never saw Max like that. Um, uh, so may maybe it's also just like him getting older and wiser. <laughs> but I don't know what's going on. But I like the. That I also think it's partly the. I mean, we all prepare the mask for the people we're supposed to be meeting, right? I think it was Shakespeare that once said something along those lines, right? Uh, so for different audiences, you have to prepare a different mask. You have to be a different media personality, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's probably not essential to to uh, scream one and a half hours at my podcast that usually is really relaxed and chill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question, an interesting one for you. You came become CEO uh, on the height of of the market in 2021. Mm -hmm. How was that? Like you came really like at the, what, what you said, February 2021. That's kind of like uh, the 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 bulls. I don't know if it was the top, but it was like at least in the year of the top. It was close. Uh, yeah. So you lived kind of. I, how, how was that? I, I, I mean, uh, obviously, I mean, that wasn't my first Bitcoin cycle, right? That wasn't my first hype cycle. Uh, I had been prior to that through two. So I guess like right now we can say I'm in the midst of my fourth cycle, right? So I know how this market works. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the shareholders of Samara, which back then was Cryptology Asset Group, one of the reasons that I think that they asked me to step in uh, was A, I had a lot of experience through Deutsche Digital, um, being a 
crypto portfolio manager, being a licensed regulated crypto asset manager. And at that time, uh, we were managing a little bit of Cryptology's money. So it really kind of just made sense for me to step in because I was actually CEO of the company, uh, both companies for two years um, before I stepped down from uh, Deutsche Digital. I think it was at the end of so the end of last year, the end of 2022, I forget exactly. Uh, life's a whirlwind. Um, but I knew what was coming. So we prepared for that. On one hand, it was absolutely wonderful that the balance sheet after we had listed had ballooned from something like 30 to 35 million up to nearly a half a billion. Fantastic that that happened. But nonetheless, I knew that the recession in Bitcoin was going to be setting in. And lo and behold, it did. Uh, Bitcoin went from 60-ish down. I think the lowest we saw was something around 16, 17,000 um, during that low cycle. I forget exactly. And one of our portfolio companies, Northern Data, I mean, it really rode uh, the Bitcoin hype because, I mean, it was a Bitcoin miner at the time. Northern went from something like 20 euros a share up to 140. And then I think at its ultimate trial, it went down to six euros a share. Uh, so that had a huge impact on our balance sheet, obviously. And we use some of our liquid assets for leverage. I think any, um, any holding company obviously tries to do that. But because I knew that that was coming, and I'm very anti-cyclical in my investment approach. I believe that when there's blood in the streets, that's when you need to be investing. That's when you need to be buying. That's when you need to be building. But when your grandma asks you, oh, how's Bitcoin doing at Christmas? That's when you know you need to get the fuck out. Um, never out of Bitcoin, but you know that the, the bear market is about to happen. So we were very well prepared. Um, obviously, there's nothing we can really do about the balance sheet. Uh, we rode Bitcoin all the way down to the bottom. We rode Northern Data to the bottom. We rode all the other assets down. I'm not a trader by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a buy and hodl guy. So we bought and we hodled. And then gradually, the markets always started to rebound. Um, we've rode that out for a couple of years. We invested in a lot of funds. We invested in some companies. And every single one of them uh, ended up performing well. We did have like two legacy companies that were invested in in 2018, 2019 that went belly up over that period of time. Um, it happens. Uh, they weren't my investments. They were from the uh, legacy portfolio, as I had said before. It, it's just one of the downsides of being in the venture space. But now that we're about to hit a massive liquidity injection, I believe, um, in the macro economy over the coming months. Plus, uh, we're going to see the outcome of the US election over the course of the next week, week and a half. I'm very optimistic on the macro environment moving forward into Q1 and Q2 next year. I think we haven't even begun to scratch the bull market, um, not just from a Bitcoin perspective, but macro as well. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so much so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to 
have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. As I think the, the period right now is really interesting uh, because it's like there's no blood in the streets, like the, the bit, uh, Bitcoin market is up since since a long time and it's up uh, a, a good amount, but it feels still like the, the bull market is just getting started, like the, 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 the crazy calls, like the grandma calls, as you described it, it's not there yet. Uh, I, I get some more calls right now, actually, like it, it's, it's, it's crazy how bullish actually my family and my surrounding is. I don't know if that's just because <laughs> I've been so vocal about bitcoin or it's actually like happening now um where do you think are we right now in the in, in the in the bitcoin cycle uh and and what do you expect over like the next two three four years um i mean i expect a lot of the same right um i think i mean so every year it takes a couple of months of consolidation post the halving uh, before we really start to see that Bitcoin price truly rip and reach new all-time highs. And granted, uh, we did set a new all-time high earlier this year, getting up to around 73,000, 74,000. I do think it's going to be going substantially higher than that over the course of the coming months. And I think that we're still in this lull period, largely because everyone is waiting to see the outcome of the US election. Um, because even like you said, I mean, you're a Bitcoiner, you're an Austrian, you've been following the US election more so than Austrian politics, just because of what that has on a macro global impact, right? Um, I mean, we're either going to get Donald Trump, who did have a very good economy, or we're going to get communism that is very anti-Bitcoin in Kamala Harris. So there's massive impacts that could come out of this election cycle, uh, both for Bitcoin and for the global macro economy as a whole. And it's going to be interesting to see how all of this shakes out over the next week or two. Um, and get your popcorn ready. It's going to be absolute fireworks, I think. I am, I'm, I'm already stoked. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well uh, two small things are different uh, this cycle. The the one thing is we reached an, a nominal all time high before the halving. I think that never happened before. Yep. And uh, we have the Bitcoin ETF in in America, which is also kind of a big deal. Do you think that, or like, what do you think is the impact uh, of of those two things uh, on, on the cycle overall? And there's always like <laughs> I know every cycle there's this talk of a super cycle. Uh, I don't like to bring it up again, but uh, I think like at some point th those cycles might actually break. How, how do you think about uh, the impact of the Bitcoin ETF and the cycles overall in, in the future? I mean. Clearly, we reached that new all-time high before the halving uh, because of the hype around the Bitcoin ETF, right? Um, the e e uh, we had like, what, 10 ETFs that were approved all on the same day, and they end up going on to become far and away the most successful ETF launches in history, Um which I don't even necessarily think BlackRock expected that. I don't think... um Fidelity or anybody else necessarily expected that. I think that they knew it was going to be successful. We knew the demand was there, but were they going to be as successful as quickly as they did? No, absolutely. No, nobody, I think, reasonably expected that. So it's great to see that it finally got done. Um, I am, so I personally have always felt that the Bitcoin ETF, while yes, monumental, uh, just because some people prefer a user journey of holding an ETF, some institutions from a regulatory or compliance perspective have to hold an ETF relative to native Bitcoin. Um, it's just the way of the world, I suppose. Uh, but I don't even think that that was necessarily the biggest news uh, for Bitcoin over the last year or so. For me, and this is my uh, CPA nerd background. I mean, I used to be an auditor with PwC, right? For me, the FASB's ruling that Bitcoin on balance sheets can be fair valued and should be fair valued, uh, that was bigger news, I think, than the Bitcoin ETF was. And I've been saying this for some time. And the reasoning for that is it used to be that you could only 
uh, from a financial reporting perspective for public companies, you would really only have Bitcoin recorded as of its cost on your balance sheet. And then if you sold it at some point in time, you could have a realized gain, a markup based on the proceeds of the sale. Or if you had uh, if you had to incur an impairment test, you would write down the value of the Bitcoin from an unrealized perspective. Switching that method of accounting in the last year or two um, over to complete fair value reporting, that's monumental. Uh, because it means that they can actually accurately reflect the value of Bitcoin on your books. MicroStrategy can do it. Samara Asset Group, we're IFRS reporting as a European company. But IASB will very likely follow the FASB's lead on this. Um, that means that you can properly assess the value of Bitcoin as a liquid asset on your balance sheet. And what will be interesting to see is if over the coming years, it can be considered a part of cash and cash equivalents. Um, from a uh, from a line item perspective, because that will be huge. Because then people won't just have Bitcoin running through OCI as far as income goes, but rather you'll actually be able to disclose Bitcoin as a uh, liquid asset on your balance sheet, offsetting uh, it. It'll be a current asset, offsetting current liabilities. That'll be the next big thing that I would like to see happen. The the fast pay rules, I think they are coming in December, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. Right? They take effect this December, but the FASB's already ruled it. Um, so basically, as of 1231, 2024, the accounting standard uh, officially shifts over, which is going to be huge for companies next year. I mean, we're talking about, I think I, I saw it on X recently. Um, the balances of cash that a lot of companies are holding, like Berkshire is holding nearly 200 billion. Apple has been holding on to 100 billion for God knows how long. Microsoft, which recently just announced, or not announced, but rather they put in their shareholders proxy voting this upcoming uh, voting session for Microsoft, should they use their cash proceeds to buy and hold Bitcoin? And we'll see how their shareholders vote. If their shareholders are smart and they've been watching what's been happening with MicroStrategy, they'll obviously ratify uh, that. that. Um, and you got to remember who the second biggest shareholder of Microsoft is. It's BlackRock. Um, he's the they're the second biggest holders of MicroStrategy uh, behind Bill Gates. Guess what instrument they're probably going to use at Microsoft to buy and hold Bitcoin? Um, it's probably going to be that magical BlackRock ETF. So... That's going to have massive impact because now companies starting January 1st, 2025 will be able to fair value Bitcoin. And that trillions upon trillions of dollars that is sitting in cash around the world can be deployed to Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset. Um, so I'm actually real excited to see what will happen there because that could be, again, a bigger impact than what the Bitcoin ETFs had earlier this year on Bitcoin's price. How, how likely, uh, if you have to put a percentage on that with uh, keeping in mind with the BlackRock one and uh, the, the storm that Bitcoin has made <laughs> uh, around the Microsoft thing, how likely is it that Microsoft actually goes ahead and buys Bitcoin in the next year? I, I, I So I would maybe, I don't know. Um, the conspiracy theorist in me would probably say it's already a hundred percent guarantee. Um, and I base that almost exclusively on BlackRock, uh, owning something like nine to 10%. I forget the exact number, but I think it's roughly nine to 10% of Microsoft, which means that at the actual shareholder meeting, the proxy vote, they're probably going to end up being a substantial amount, um, of the voting, which means that, okay, I think it's, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or I think it's just Bill because they got divorced. Um, so the foundation or wherever Bill Gates has his shares, that's number one. The only person that I think can block this will be uh, Bill Gates. And I don't know if he's ever said anything positively or negatively about Bitcoin. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong there, but I don't, off the top of my head right now, I can't remember him ever saying anything about Bitcoin. He, he he made some comments, but I don't know exactly what it was. Not positive, not negative. It was some some weird comments, like maybe just <laughs> like I don't cool understand technology Bitcoin. or something like that. I don't know. Um, but I think he's the only one that would probably be able to kill it because I do believe that the reason this is included on the proxy is because of BlackRock and the ETF. Um, so I, the conspiracy theorist in me, already is saying it's a done deal. 
Uh, they will be buying Bitcoin over the next year. <laughs> the rational me is looking at this and saying 20 to 25% likelihood um, just because it, corporate boardrooms, uh, proxies, all this kind of stuff. It's a complex, bureaucratic, overly regulated world. I don't know. Um, I'm not a Microsoft shareholder or I don't know, maybe I am through my old 401k somewhere, I guess. I'm, I'm not even entirely sure. Um, but I would be surprised if they start at any time in the relative near future. I, I, I mean, it's, it's also, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, the, the signal of that is amazing. Like only the, that Microsoft now has to take an official stance, probably also Bill Gates has to kind of take an official or unofficial <laughs> stance on Bitcoin now. And this alone, this state in, 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 in the, in the history, and then now compared to like one year in the future, yeah. two years in the future, when then the Microsoft, uh, shareholders can say like, oh, we did not buy it one year ago. Now we missed up out on that one. Uh, let's, let's do it again. This vote, like, like, let's, let's see if, if we now want to, to buy it now. So I think that's, that alone is a big thing. So this is why. I mean, we, we're a public company and we hold Bitcoin on our balance sheet. It is our only treasury reserve asset. We don't even hold, like we literally hold at Samara Asset Group um, enough euro for maybe a month or two of just general operational expenses. I mean, we have lawyers we have to pay. We have, we have administrators we have to pay. We have regulators we have to pay, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but everything else is in Bitcoin. And it has to be in Bitcoin because the Bitcoin will always continue to appreciate relative to fiat. Um, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and shit on fiat or poo-poo it, but everything I do believe over time does go to zero relative to Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is just absolute perfection in its monetary policy that that's the inevitability of Bitcoin relative to all other assets. Um, now, if I'm a small public company and I look at a, what has happened with micro strategy, which that is a very unique circumstance. I mean, Michael Saylor was really early when he started to do this. Um, I mean, we actually owned Bitcoin before Michael Saylor, uh, but either way, uh, obviously he's been significantly more vocal and better about this over the last couple of years. than we've been able to be being a European company. Um, I don't think, for most public companies, the Michael Saylor strategy makes a lot of sense. Um, he's taking a massive amount of risk on his books with all of the perpetual bonds that he's issuing, and it's continuing to dilute himself. And he's basically now derived 90 to 90%, 5% of the value of his company in Bitcoin. That's not for everybody. Um, I think... Regardless, though, everybody should be holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet and anything that doesn't need to be used for operations should be in Bitcoin. But what I advocate for Microsoft, for instance, to go out and issue a hundred billion bond, which it probably could if it wanted to, um, but to issue a hundred billion bond to buy 90 billion in Bitcoin and have a 10 billion cash reserve. No, that, that probably wouldn't be smart for Microsoft to do. But if I'm a small public company and I see that Microsoft is clearly planning something around Bitcoin. I look at this and I go, yeah, you know what? That's probably an inevitability. Maybe it doesn't happen this year, but it is an inevitability that Microsoft will be buying Bitcoin. And they're huge. So maybe they could do something like a sailor playbook. Maybe I should be rethinking my corporate treasury strategy. And if I can front run Microsoft and I can acquire a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand Bitcoin, um, based on whatever size my company is and how many liquid reserve assets I have. And I can put most of it into Bitcoin without bankrupting the company. That might not be a bad idea. So I think you're going to start to see more low and mid cap companies that are publicly traded. Uh, they're probably going to end up following suit and try to front run Microsoft. I mean, there's a couple of public companies in the US that now hold Bitcoin. MicroStrategy, of course, being the flagship and then Tesla. Uh, but even Tesla sold a good chunk of it, although it hasn't lately. Um, Tesla and MicroStrategy are kind of in a microcosm of, let's call them crazy CEOs, um, people that are well known uh, publicly. They're firebrands, right? I mean, Elon Musk and Michael Saylor. So most companies 
are not going to want to draw that level of attention to themselves. But I do think that we're going to see some of the smaller caps decide that it is a smart idea to try to front run the large caps that are clearly having internal conversations about this and inevitably will be going into Bitcoin. Um, I mean, wasn't it just recently the Google CTO came out in huge support of Bitcoin? Was that the Google CTO or the, the Microsoft uh, one? I forget. I, 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 the Microsoft CTO, the actually. Microsoft, okay. Microsoft CTO says it. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm mixing them up the, then. Okay, so I, I mean, there's just another endorsement from uh, one of the head guys at Microsoft about how great Bitcoin is. Um, like I said, the conspiracy theorist in me thinks that it's already an inevitability uh, that they'll be putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet, but I think it's 20 to 25% over the course of the coming year. Absolutely. The Microsoft CTO, I uh, just saw the Simply Bitcoin uh, uh, tweet of that said, I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before, but Bitcoin is an incredible, powerful concept. And I don't think we have fully grasped what it could mean for society. So, I mean, that's a pretty <laughs> bullish statement. It's a very bullish statement. And the truth is, is that he's right. I mean, you even alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, Donald Trump maybe understands 2% of what Bitcoin is. Uh, even the best of the best, Michael Saylor, you said at best, he probably 80% understands what Bitcoin is. I don't know. Maybe that means I'm in the 70 to 75% range. I don't know. Um, I would like to hope that I understand Bitcoin nearly as well as Saylor. Um but I truly do not yet think, A, I don't think we've seen, let's call it the final evolution, the final stage of what Bitcoin can and should be. Uh, we're so far off from what that is. And I don't mean from a uh, price perspective, what its price is relative to the dollar. I mean, we talked about that a little bit here because, I mean, yeah, we're on your podcast. Of course, we have to talk about it if you ask me about it. For me, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. I really don't care where the price is. I buy every hour on the hour, Bitcoin. Um, I don't care where the price is. Um, I, I use River personally doing that. Uh, Alexander Leishman's company in the United States. It's an automated buy, DCAing in every hour on the hour, and I don't care where the price is. I like it when it goes down personally because then I get to buy more. But obviously, I like it when it's up being the CEO of Samara Asset Group. So it's a fun internal struggle I have, right? But we haven't yet seen, I think, what will be the final evolution of Bitcoin, which I don't even think because the technology wasn't available back then, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever they were, necessarily fathomed. I mean, when you think about Bitcoin, of course, its initial white paper um, is being this peer-to-peer e-money, -peer e right? Um, being uh, being this censorship-resistant, uh, intermediaryless payment system, digital payment system. That's how Satoshi envisioned this. That's how the initial uh, white paper was written. That's how everything was enacted. Fast forward a couple of years, and only the real OGs necessarily appreciated Bitcoin in that initial stage of what it is and what it was. But everybody started to realize, okay, actually, yeah, it's great that it can be a peer-to-peer -peer res uh, censorship-resistant e-cash, but it actually looks and operates more like a digital commodity, more like digital gold. I think the next evolution, and, and like, um, I mean, that the digital gold thing was a bit of a clever uh, rebrand of Bitcoin for masses and for institutions that didn't yet understand why we needed a new digital payment system or necessarily had the same cypherpunk libertarian values that maybe people like you and I do have from the Austrian economic school that we see the value of government less money, right? Um, institutions don't get that. They love government money because they get it for free all the time from the Federal Reserve, right? Um, if, where do you think that money gets uh, printed to? So that's where that evolution of Bitcoin uh, helped us reach the adoption levels that we have right now. And that's why the ETF is being successful. So great. A new narrative, a new use case, digital gold, fine. I'm all for it. But I don't think that that's the final evolution of Bitcoin. And I personally even think that using the narrative of digital gold and even the narrative of censorship resistant peer-to-peer uh, e-cash, -peer e I think those sell Bitcoin a little bit short of what it can and inevitably will be. And this is going to be my accounting bias because I think of Bitcoin instead of as just a cash or hard money or as digital gold. I think of Bitcoin more as a ledger system. And I think with the advent 
of layer twos. And that hopefully we'll be able to still leverage the decentralization and security of Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin's perfected that. Bitcoin is the perfectly secure money. It is the most decentralized money, but it hasn't yet been scalable, nor has it had utility built into it, right? So that is where with the advent of layer twos, I think we will see, oh, sorry, someone's giving me a call. I think we will inevitably see Utility brought to Bitcoin, tokenization brought to Bitcoin, real world asset tokenization brought to Bitcoin, stable coins brought to Bitcoin, government issued stable coins secured uh, on the Bitcoin network. I think when this happens and, and even uh, capital markets, um, by the way, so like uh, digital gold will be traded on Bitcoin, uh, parcels of land. Equities, debts, derivatives, tokenized financial instruments traded on Bitcoin. I think that's an inevitability. And when you see that happen, Bitcoin evolves from being digital gold and the world's most perfected form of hard money. It becomes the digital ledger system upon which all of global finance, all of global commerce transacts. And I think we're probably five to 10 years away from that, at least. A lot of regulatory questions to be answered, a lot of compliance questions to be answered, a lot of technology that needs to be built uh, in and around Bitcoin or that needs to be encoded into Bitcoin Core. Um, like we're having that huge conversation about covenants uh, right now with Bitcoin and we'll see what happens there, right? Um, but I definitely think that that is the inevitability of Bitcoin. And that is so much more than anything I think most people today are imagining. And it's significantly more than Satoshi even imagined when he wrote the white paper. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that's so true. Um, I, I love that a lot. Yeah, really cool, the, that uh, short rant there. Um, we have in the end routine of our podcast, two quick questions. The first is always the same question for each guest. Uh, and the question for you is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Oh, nothing. I'm not a very smart person. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I mean, um, I, I don't know if you like golf, uh, you can follow me. I, I, I love golf. I post all the time on my Twitter, my ex about golf. Um, I used to be a scratch golfer. Now I'm still a single handicapper. Uh, I have friends that ask me for tips all the time in it. Um, I mean, we actually hosted the first ever, uh, world Bitcoin golf championship at Bitcoin Nashville. Uh, this year. Um, and that was actually a lot of fun. That tournament ended up being significantly bigger and more fun than I think any of us ever imagined. We had a, um, we had a hole in one competition that I sponsored uh, at this tournament. And basically we said, if you get a hole in one, Samara is going to give you an entire Bitcoin, no questions asked. And uh, you know what? So actually I ended up being, it was a par three. So like 145 yard par three, I think it was. Um, so I took my pitching wedge and I literally parked it at like two and a half, three feet um, from the hole, which would have been so cool if I had been able to win my company's own Bitcoin. Um, but I ended up not even winning closest to the pin. Uh, one younger kid, I think he was in his twenties. Um, he ended up parking it like six inches, uh, but we had it on video and everything. It was so cool. But on one of the other par threes, uh, one of the guys, and he was a scratch golfer, he hit a hole in one. Um, so naturally we didn't give him the Bitcoin because, Hey, he didn't hit it on the right hole. Uh, so we gave him a doge coin, uh, just to fuck with him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, we, uh, we, 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 we had fun with that. He was like, oh, just don't even send it to me. And I'm like, nope, give me your wallet. You're getting a Dogecoin for hitting a big uh, hole in one on the wrong hole. That's like a punishment for that. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> really cool. exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, we have an end routine in podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Um, what are the biggest, what is the biggest challenge that Bitcoin will face in the future? Oof, politicians. Um, I think it will, the biggest challenge that Bitcoin will always continue to face, I do think will be politicians and weaponized three letter agencies, which it, it, frankly, it isn't even a challenge for Bitcoin. Um, the reason being because you can't beat Bitcoin. There is no killing Bitcoin. There is no banning Bitcoin. Yes, you can take and physically lock me up, throw away the key, but you'll never under any circumstances, no government on this God's earth will ever be able to take my Bitcoin from me or be able to ban my ability to use Bitcoin 
maybe it has to be on black markets because we go down this full globalist tyrannical route. I don't know what the world's going to look like 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. I hope we don't get there. I hope we, I hope we as Bitcoiners are able to show to the world what individual sovereignty and individual financial sovereignty is and why it needs to be fundamentally protected by governments around the world and by us as individuals around the world. But you see the attacks against Bitcoin. You see the ESG movement trying to weaponize itself against Bitcoin, which is ridiculous because Bitcoin is far and away the most ESG friendly investment on earth. I mean, ESG is not my thing, but Bitcoin is the best ESG investment on earth and it's not even a conversation. Um, and you saw the most recent one. Uh, who was it? Um, I think it was the ECB recently came out and said, yeah, Bitcoin is bad because it's unfair that people that held Bitcoin early are making a lot of money and other people will not make money on Bitcoin, which is just the absolute most asinine communist statement the ECB could have ever made about Bitcoin. So you are going to see those types of globalist communists, leftists, whatever you want to call them. And you're all going to see it on the right. Don't get me wrong. You're going to see people on the right attack it as well, too. But all the attacks right now are coming from the left side. Um, that's going to be its biggest threat. But again, I don't even necessarily see it as a threat to Bitcoin itself because you cannot kill, you cannot ban Bitcoin. Maybe I should rephrase this. That is the biggest threat to Bitcoiners. Uh, I think that's that's really, really great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, not the threat to <laughs> the Bitcoin is great, but uh, <laughs> your answer was really, really great. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Pat, for, for being on the show. Before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions uh, and, and learn more about you? I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, you can follow us at Samara Asset Group. I mean, we're relatively active on Twitter, we're, or I guess you call it X. I'm never going to get used to calling it X. Um, you can also you can also follow me on X. It's just the, at Patrick Lowry. Um, we're, we're pretty active there. I talk a lot about what we're doing with Samara, and I share a lot of my, well, politically incorrect insights at times, I suppose. Uh, when I'm there. Um, you can also follow our proof of word podcast. I have my own proof of words. Um, we invite people from within the industry on to talk about Bitcoin, as well as other things that I find interesting. Um, so yeah, if you ever want to follow or learn something from me, like I said, I'm not a smart guy. I can't tell you anything you're going to learn besides Bitcoin, but uh, always happy to have more people as a part of our community. Thank you so much, uh, Pat, for being on. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is joining us today for uh, taking time. Also, uh, I will be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.